Good afternoon, everyone. It is Monday, April 5th, 2021. Welcome to Cup of Joe Conversations with Vandals. And uh, I'm admiring some of the beverages that are being uh, uh, partaken uh, around the, the screen today. My name is Kenton Bird. I am an alum from the class of 1976, and I'm on the faculty of the School of Journalism and Mass Media. And I'd like to welcome you today to our program. We have three big topics to cover today. Uh, we're going to share memories of the late Terry Armstrong, longtime faculty member and administrator at the University of Idaho. We're going to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the founding of the Found Money Fund of Idaho in January of 1981. And we're going to have a preview of Vandal Giving Day, which happens tomorrow, April 6th. Um, here, our format for today is that I will uh, ask a series of questions of our three panelists, and then we'll throw it up to uh, some Q&A from the audience. And we do have a, a special guest to introduce who had a very special association with Terry and that Found Money Fund. Uh, in the early years. Uh, so uh, the three panelists uh, today uh, are Mary Kay McFadden, our Vice President for University Advancement, Carol Wilson, a longtime staff member at the University of Idaho and an administrative assistant to President Richard Gibb and worked closely with uh, Terry in the President's office, and Bruce Pittman, our retired Dean of Students for whom the Bruce Pittman Center, uh, which many of you know as the old sub, uh, was named in his honor a few years ago. And I'm gonna start with Bruce. Uh, he's gonna get uh, us going here uh, with just a little bit uh, about uh, Terry. Uh, tell us a little bit about Terry Armstrong. Uh, when and why did he come to the University of Idaho and when did you first meet him? <laughs> Terry Armstrong is, was one of the most interesting people I've ever known. And I was fortunate to have him as my boss for 11 years. And uh, Terry came to us from Southern Idaho. He uh, uh, grew up in the Twin Falls area and uh, uh, played basketball there. And uh, eventually went to uh, University of Southern Mississippi and played uh, college ball there for, for four years. And uh, when he graduated um, in, in biology uh, from, from there, he uh, came to Salmon, Idaho, uh, where he taught and taught high school and uh, met his, uh, the love of his life, Pat. And uh, uh, he, he spent several years there teaching, but very soon in his teaching career, um, he was able to get a NSF um, fellowship to the University of Idaho to work on a master's degree. And so he spent three summers uh, coming up here for his master's. And then um, he was quite known, quite well known, quite well loved. And um, Dean Samuelson uh, invited him to come up and be on our faculty in 1967. So he and Pat moved to Moscow, Idaho in, in 1967 to uh, begin his, his teaching career on our faculty. Um, you asked another question, and that was when I, when did I, I first meet Terry? I, I, I'm, I, I spent a lot of time at the College of Education, and I can remember one time uh, hopping in the elevator, and the door was getting ready to close, and all of a sudden, his hand stuck through the door to kind of keep it from closing. The door opens, and this big person walks in and fills up most of the elevator. And he looks down at me and he goes, hey brother, are you feeling perky today? <laughs> and uh, I, I'll uh, never quite forget that because that was obviously the greeting that he shared with, with lots of people around campus. So um, from that time on, um, uh, we, I accumulated some nicknames as did many of the people that uh, came in contact with Terry. And so, uh, like I said, I was fortunate to have a 11 years of a, a very, very close working relationship with him in the presence office. 
Bruce, tell us just a little bit about the fiscal climate at the University of Idaho in the early 1980s and uh, to help lay the groundwork for the founding of the, the Found Money Fund. Sure. Uh, again, there's no surprise. Uh, the university has gone through uh, a, a number of times when we've had budget, budget challenges. And uh, Dr. Gibb found himself in a very difficult position in the late 70s. Uh, and we had to, to make some very, very uh, uh, substantial budget uh, reductions in that first year or two that he was here. And I remember um, we were a much smaller university at that time, and he had to make some emergency decisions to uh, eliminate about 130, 140 positions. And uh, during a particular spring, uh, put us all on a four-day work week. And so, uh, you know, we, we had to, to kind of close the budget gap uh, through our own salaries, but I, I think that 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 was kind of the climate in the background for um, Terry's uh, budget theater. I, I, I couldn't, I, I can't describe it any other way. The Found Money Fund um, was a, a product of uh, he and Carol and a few other people uh, having fun finding some money, and then they created this uh, fun monster that became the Found Money Fund, and. Um, literally, it was budget theater because he would uh, use the, the stories about the found money fund whenever he could tell those stories, whether it was to legislators or to um, you know, other people around the, the, the states. And um, it was both funny, but it was also serious because he would always have the punchline that every penny counts and that we were taking care of the investments that we have very, very carefully. Uh, the other important part of it was that he welcomed like lots him. and lots of people into the president's office to make the little deposits. And he made people feel like they were part of the team. Uh, when custodians or students or uh, faculty, a lot of people who frankly would never feel welcomed into the president's office felt entitled to come in and just joyfully welcomed with their few pennies because again, Terry made them feel important and made them feel like they were part of the team. Bruce, we'll come back to you for some other memories, but uh, before we leave those early thoughts, I have a couple of pictures to share. Um, so uh, you see on the left, uh, Terry in his office, in the president's office, and on the right, uh, Bruce and Terry uh, in their roles in the Moscow Community Theater production of The Sound of Music, a show directed by Ed Chavez. And uh, Ed found the largest instrument he could for Bruce and the smallest instrument he could for Terry uh, to emphasize uh, the, the difference in their sizes. They only had a cameo role uh, at the end of the show, but they brought down the house. So uh, let's turn next uh, to Carol. And uh, you were in on the ground floor there, but uh, I'd like to know a little bit about your first impressions of Terry when uh, you walked into the president's office. Hi, Kenton. That's a sort of a three-part answer to that. The first impression, I have to be honest, I was scared to death of him. I'd never heard of him. I'd never seen him. And I was 100% intimidated. So I'm a, a young grad from the university, and I had the opportunity to apply for that job as um, Dr. Gibbs' assistant. And um, unbeknownst to me, I'd had a very nice interview with Dr. Gibbs, very enjoyable. But part of the process was that I had to meet with the three vice presidents, so Mr. McKinney and Dr. Ferguson and Terry. And honestly, that was a very humbling, I, I have never before or since been grilled like that. And there was no funny guy, prankster, nice guy, Terry. I mean, they were very, very serious with me. So I left there being intimidated by Terry and humbled. And um, that's how my first impression was. There was some miracle happened and I was, um, lucky enough to get that job with President Gibb. And so I went into work thinking, well, 
there's the tall quirky guy that doesn't really care for me too much. <laughs> I guess it'll be okay. I didn't know how that whole thing worked. And the first day of work, I think all of you, the other three will remember, it was the Monday after Mount St. Helens blew up on Sunday. So I show up at the president's office and it is total chaos. You know, no, it, it is chaos like you have never seen before. And at that point, my impression of Terry was, well, he's, you know, he is a good chief of staff. He's directing traffic. He's, he's taken charge and that whole week's a blur. So I guess the first fair impression of Terry came about my second week of work and you know, then he became that person that um, everybody knows him for and for which I was appreciative. You know, he was a teacher and listener and so knowledgeable. And um, he gave a kid like me a chance, you know, to become well prepared. And we were a good team uh, for President Gibb, I think. Um, you know, it was all about making people feel welcome, taking care of the issues. It's a pretty, um, it's a pretty stressful office to work in. And, you know, we, you're always on your A game. And I have to say the prankster part, that fun part of Terry would come out, you know, after hours before when there was nobody else around. And, and um, it was pretty much of a pressure cooker the rest of the time. And like Bruce said, very serious times because of the budget issues. So I have quite a few impressions the first couple of weeks. So the following January, after Mount St. Helens, uh, you're in the president's office, and uh, uh, somehow uh, the, the chemistry happened, the, the genesis of the idea. Uh, tell us uh, what led you and Terry to say, not only were you going to collect money, but you were go actually going to uh, uh, put it aside for some noble purpose. Well, that's kind of overstating how that all started. That sounds quite important. And I have to say, if I can just make this clear, T Terry, this whole found money thing, totally 100% Terry Armstrong. He was, you know, the conductor of that whole train and he was nice enough to let me come along and always called me his co-founder, co-director. And we did find that first bit of money kind of together. We were both working there. And, so the story is, Terry's walking to work like he is every day. It's January 5th, 1981. He walks by the Alpha Gam house down Nespers Drive, finds three pennies. And this is the part he doesn't really put in his book or anything. I, I remember it clearly. He put those pennies in his shoe, not his pocket, but in his shoe. It comes in work that morning. And my nickname, as Bruce alluded, we all got called something different than our given name. He called me Yanso. My, my name was... Carol Yenny, but Yanso is what he called me. So he says, hey, Yanso, my foot hurts. Well, how come? Well, I've got pennies in my shoe. And I said, well, if you have pennies in your shoe and your foot hurts, why don't you like, take them out of your shoe? That's, that's the way this got started. So he took them out. And can you believe this? This is Terry Armstrong's Watkins jelly jar. And he had this on his desk. So he put those three pennies in this jar. And then, oh, about a week later, I happened to find a nickel. So uh, we, we thought, oh, yeah, we find money. We find money around. Money's always laying around. Let's, it was January, let's find money all year long. We'll get a few people in this with us. And, you know, my good friends who are watching know I leaned on them a little and Terry's friends around campus and, and Terry and I in the president's office. So we're finding money. And our only sole goal, sole goal was to have a party at the end of the year. That's all we wanted. Times were tough. Everybody was stressed. Let's just have a party and it won't cost us anything. We have no money. It won't cost us anything because we're going to find it. So um, that's, that was our goal. Uh, Kenton was to find money. Have a party. So here's the truth of the matter. In the December, we've been working all year, getting people to help us, and we had ten dollars and eighty cents, and that was not going to be much of a party. So we decided to continue it on. You know, there, it, it looking back, this has been quite a 
opportunity for me to go through all the archives because I've got all of Terry's stuff and everything he generated for 33 years here at the house. But um, the the notes that we have, the from 1982 on through Terry's life are very, very precise and there's there, there's an unbelievable amount of information he recorded. But that first year, you know, we didn't really think to record because we were just having a party. There's some little notes in that first year though, 1981 in my files about uh, we would loan money. You know, we, we had a few pennies loan money to the uh, couple of Kappa friends who'd come in and need a Coca-Cola between classes. So they'd borrow a quarter and bring us back a nickel interest when they paid it back, you know? So he's thinking he's building this money up and he had scams like that going on. That was year one. We'll come back to uh, when and how did the fund start uh, gaining momentum, uh, but I want to share a, another uh, photo here, and uh, this is uh, Carol and Terry on uh, uh, outside the Vandal store in Moscow uh, with a copy of Terry's book, uh, his memoir called Wrangling Snakes and Other Reminiscences of an Idaho Teacher, and uh, I, I don't know what that check was. I can see that it's made payable to the Found Money Fund of Idaho, but uh, Carol, do you remember who it was from and uh, was it really legitimate uh, found money? Well, I just happened to find this. This is the flyer from that day. And I couldn't remember what it was and Sandy couldn't either, but it was a book signing. Um, set up down at Starbucks at, at the bookstore. And of course it was an opportunity to collect money. But the deal with that check is interesting is that the, all those students that worked at Starbucks, they uh, received tips, but they couldn't keep the tip. And so all that money, I think that checks of $1,600 or something, he worked a deal so that that went right into the found money fund. So that was kind of a bonanza. Well, let's go into uh, year two. Uh, the fund got a, a big boost and went from uh, um, pennies and nickels to um, real cash in the form of uh, $50 bills. Um, why don't you set up the story and then we'll in invite Karen to, to tell her piece of it. So here's the, the turning point and how the fund got momentum and actual money. You know, we had 10 bucks is uh, it's April of 82, as I go back, that is when Mr. McKinney gave the edict to all of us at the university, you may not keep uh, petty cash in your desk anymore. No, there had been some kind of infraction. And well, Jerry and I, we, had, we didn't know what else we were gonna do with it. And they said, you can't keep it. So we finally bit the bullet and decided we were going to donate it to the university. That, heck, we'll have to abandon the party. We're gonna donate our fund. And we had $44 and we were darn proud of that. And uh, the university wouldn't take it. You should have heard Terry on that story. They don't want our money. And he was very indignant about it. And enter Bob Steele, the trust investment officer. And he says, okay, you can invest that. Yes, please donate it. You can invest it in um, the Academic Excellent Endowment, which is part of the um, CIT, Consolidated Investment Trust. So then we would keep our, the integrity of our little money and we can add to our little fund. And, and so we were okay about that. And in order to do that, Kenton, Terry had to have a name for our fund to keep it separate. Well, he made that up on the spur of the moment, the Found Money Fund of Idaho. So, you know, it's not like we spent a lot of time thinking of that or that we started out being very altruistic. But I think um, it's kind of important to note that when we turned that money over, hard found money, and uh, we switched from being very self-serving, which was just all about us in a party, to uh, developing an attitude of philanthropy. And so that's what's really gone forward all these many years, but it was pretty darn funny. Um, Terry starts thinking big, 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 big. He's out recruiting people and he um, 
he wants to promote the find more finders, promote the vision, make this something really special so that at the bicentennial, where do you get this? At the bicentennial, we're going to save our money till then, and then we're going to start distributing it. And so, I mean, he's, you know, he never missed an opportunity to talk about things. But the Idahonian uh, ran a story, the publicity hound, and he, it ran the local paper and we didn't think anything about it, but the Associated Press Wire picked that up. We didn't know anything about it. Pretty soon, that story about our little found money fund has run in every major newspaper in the United States. And I've, Terry kept track of all these and we're hearing from people all over the country. It's, you know, it's the Miami Herald and it's the Anchorage paper and Ithaca, New York and New Jersey and USA Today and Wilmington, Honolulu. I mean, every state and there's alums, there's people that don't know us. We've got all this press. And then what, I mean, he is, he is in heaven. He's got all these finders because we're needing finders. So this is when NBC calls him and they've got a deal. Come to Hollywood. So Karen knows this story far better than I do. And I'm going to show a, a picture of uh, what that looked like uh, in uh, Hollywood. That was a NBC game show called uh, Fantasy. And uh, Terry writes about uh, it in uh, his book. And uh, Karen was a member of the women's basketball team at the time. And I think uh, chosen uh, again for the, the contrast uh, between her height and Terry's. And uh, so Karen can uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, what happened when you got to California and how you ended up in this plexiglass cube with $50 bills flying around? Yeah, so when, when he, I found out about this found money fund and getting to go on this game show, I thought he was a little crazy, but I was game and let's do it. And especially again, our size difference, I'm five feet tall, he was what, six, nine or something. Um, so I had to get it cleared with basketball coaches and we flew down to Burbank, California and got to go on this show. They brought us in. It was well on the way there too. It was interesting because we found all kinds of money. It was great. We were checking vending machines and newspaper machines. And when we went for coffee, we find money. It was, it was wild, but they put us in on this show in the audience. They had two seats picked out for us. And we went in like during a commercial sometime because the show was already going on and they put us in these seats during a commercial and these people behind us actually had gone to the University of Idaho and they wanted to give us some money and we kind of tried to explain that it was supposed to be found money and they're like oh we found it you know and that was like 46 cents or something like that I can't remember the amount but it was it was just unreal all these things that kept happening um, but anyway our part in the show was to get in this fantasy fountain they called it and it was this glass encased uh, place and they had $50 bills blowing all over. It wasn't real money, but it represented $50. And the, the rules were that we couldn't get it off the sides and we couldn't get it off the floor. Well, he wanted to get it off the sides and I wanted to get off the floor because I was pretty close to the ground. Anyhow, um, I think it was 30 seconds we had to get as much as we could. And we were just stuffing it in our shirt and you know, letting it blow up under our shirt and whatever way we could get it. And we, I don't think we really did all that great, but Peter Marshall, who was the host of the show, who's like 6'6", six, six, um, he picked up a whole bunch of money off the ground when our timer went up and opened the door and picked up that money and stuffed it in our shirts too. So I think we ended up bringing back $1,500 or something like that. It, it was a great trip. Yeah, well, how, 2100? 2100, Karen. Okay. Okay, great, even better. <laughs> but we had a great time and I thought it was just a fantastic opportunity and get University of Idaho on the map and people from all over wanted to send a penny and it cost them more for a stamp to send that penny to it, but it was the whole idea, so. Well, that's a great story, Karen, and thank you for joining us on short notice uh, because uh, you can tell it better than uh, any of us could because you were there so yeah it was great 
and, and uh, uh, going forward, I, I think that was a, a real tipping point in terms of the publicity uh, because it uh, uh, meant that there was real money involved and, and not just uh, loose change found from, from campus. Mary Kay, I wanna to turn to you next. Um, and uh, you've been at the university a long time. Um, when you worked at the alumni office back in the day, uh, how did alums respond to uh, requests to collect found money or send it to Terry? And uh, was that something that would come up at uh, uh, alumni gatherings during your travels? Well, alumni went crazy for the found money fund. They loved the found money fund. And in fact, in our last centennial, um, the alumni office with uh, Flip Kleffner, we organized a statewide tour and it was the Centennial Grove tour. And we put, we planted a Centennial Grove in every county of the state. So that's 44 different counties. And I bet a majority of them, every time we stopped to plant this grove of trees and to celebrate the Idaho Centennial with our alumni and friends, there were always a few alumni that would show up with their baggies full of coins for us to take back to the found money fund. And so um, my particular responsibility was very important too, because I live next door to Carol, who was the, of course, the co-director, co-finder, our co-founder. And so Carol, I'd always have to come home and report what happened at those alumni events and make sure that I had to find some money on the road. So lots of, lots of pressure and responsibility there. And uh, Mary Kay, in your role as Vice President of Advancement, uh, you are overseeing a lot of private philanthropy uh, efforts uh, towards the university. And uh, I know our audience is curious, what is the current balance in the Found Money Fund? Uh, and uh, um, what uh, is it likely to be by the time of the bicentennial in 2089? Well, I'd like a drum roll. I wish we had uh, the marching band here because we need a drum roll for this. But the current, um, thank you, Marie, I see you down there. The, the current fair market value of uh, the Found Money Fund is 500,381,087 cents. So that shows you the power of compound interest. It shows you the power of lots and lots of generosity from folks, lots of people finding money, getting in on the fun of this. And uh, anyway, very exciting total. But it just is a fraction of the bit that it will be when we land on our bicentennial in 2089. And so I wish that we could have some type of a contest where I could ask everybody to guess. But um, Carol and I compared notes and we said, okay, if Terry, if Terry Armstrong were here and he would be doing this, he would tell you the best case scenario. And um, although this is, this is doable, if we receive like 10.7% interest from now until 2089, so that's until the bicentennial, and that's our historic average interest that we, that our great foundation and their investing manages. Now, Joy will probably say, don't quite count on that amount. But if we did that in the year 2089, that fund will be $318,160,903. And at that time, that's when we can put that money into action for supporting faculty and students, and those types of activities that enhance the image of the university. And that will mean that we'll use the interest off of that. We use a certain amount of interest, 4%, and that will add up to $13.7 million every year, helping students and faculty at the University of Idaho. And who gets to decide? All three pennies. Uh, All from three pennies in Terry's shoe and five cents from Carol. That's how it started. So who gets to decide wh uh, where and when to, to spend that money after uh, we hit the, the milestone in 2089? Well, Terry and Carol, and I think Joy Fisher and others who worked with Terry in terms of the endowment agreement, decided that there would be three people that would get to... to determine that. And one would be the president of the university, so the chief executive officer. Number two would be the provost, the chief academic officer. And then number three, Bruce Pittman, um, in his um, 
his, his successor, the Dean of Students. So those three folks will get together and decide um, what students, what faculty, what types of activities they'll support. And they've made it so that it will support any activity that will enhance the image of the University of Idaho. So it could be to help a faculty member go to a conference. It could be a scholarship for a student. It could be anything like that. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a very, very valuable source of funds in our, for our bicentennial and something really to celebrate. And by that time, I'm not even counting about, um, you know, we continue to have alumni every day find money and still bring it into the foundation. So Mary Kay, that's the segue to talk about uh, the Vandal Giving Day happening tomorrow. Um, uh, when and why did Vandal Giving Day uh, emerge and what's the purpose of that event? Well, Vandal Giving is Day is a day where we put the call out to all vandals and say, hey, let's join together and do something really important for the University of Idaho. And it's, it's usually in the spring, and that's around Silver and Gold Day. And Silver and Gold Day is the day that the Alumni Association was founded. And that was on April 7th, 1889. That was the start of the Alumni Association. So that's Silver and Gold Day. And it just so happens that Vandal Giving Day coincides perfectly this year with that, April 6th and 7th. And we'll be sending out notices to all of our alums and you'll, you may hear from your classmates or your fraternity brother, your sorority sister, your person that, that was your roommate in the residence hall. And they're going to ask you to join them in supporting the faculty and students and all the great work that happens here at the University of Idaho. So Kenton, we do this every year, um, but, but this online giving effort started Started six years ago, but here's the funny thing. This is just our fifth year because we missed one year. <laughs> but last year, I have to say in COVID times, in COVID times, our alumni and friends showed up for the University of Idaho because our students and, and faculty needed their support. And we had a record giving year last year at $650,000 is what we raised last year. So uh, we're very, very excited about Vandal Giving Day and uh, we know it's just going to be another great success and it's the next two days. So I think it's 15 hours until Vandal Giving Day starts officially. I'm going to circle back to the panelists in just a minute to ask you for your favorite memory of uh, Terry Armstrong. Uh, but uh, we have an audience member, um, Rich Patterson, is going to share a story about using the Found Money Fund with the elementary students to help uh, fund programs. So uh, Rich, if uh, um, you could unmute yourself and uh, say hello. Hi, Kenton and all the vandals. Actually, I, Marion, also a grad from Idaho, have the story and- oh, Sorry, Marion, yes. That's ahead. okay. It's Rich's um, computer. We live in Iowa and I'd gone to Idaho, had met, uh, Dr. Armstrong, who said, call me Terry. I said, yes, sir. So anyway, I knew about the Found Money Fund, and I worked at an elementary school with low-income students. These kids had never been to the local symphony, the theater. They had not even gone a mile and a half to the, element, the middle school for a basketball game. So I thought, okay, what are we going to do here? So I started putting little pennies, dimes and nickels in a jar, talked to my principal and I said, I would like to raise money to take these kids to the symphony, the theater, local nonprofits. Is it okay if I collect money with certain guidelines? And she said, sure. And it was pop cans because that's how Rich and I went to college. That's how we went to Idaho. So we just started collecting pop cans. And I said to the kids, if you find any money around or you have a pop can, bring it in. I'll take the money and put it in the jar and we will go. The fourth and fifth graders all went on trips with me, every one of them. So we started doing this and I even uh, roped in the superintendent of schools. So one day the principal is giving a tour to the superintendent and a couple of the board members. They go into the gymnasium, which is my home. And there, lined up along the wall, are four pop cans, three beer cans, and a whiskey bottle. <laughs> the principal is having a fit. She's sputtering and spewing, and her, she didn't know what to say. 
And Lou Finch, the, the superintendent, laughed. He said, oh, that's right. Yeah, Marion works here. Because I went down every single week to the, the superintendent's office and raided his office of all of his pop cans. And there were just lots of them. So my little tiny found money fund came up to a few hundred bucks. I always gave the money to the secretary who put it in my little special account. And then I would take the kids, the fourth and fifth graders to the symphony, to the theater, to the University of Iowa, to field hockey games, all kinds of things. So that's one experience I have with the found money fund and it is a great idea. Marion, thank you for sharing that. And uh, I think it's important to see sort of the snowball effect of uh, this kind of uh, philanthropy that uh, uh, people are inspired and adapted to their own purposes. Uh, Archie George has put a couple of good anecdotes uh, into the chat. And uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the, the, the Chinese funeral money with the big uh, denominations and uh, uh, how uh, that was used as a, uh, a way to uh, get Terry's attention about uh, the currency you were collecting. Oh, I don't, I didn't mention in the note I posted there, which most of you can see, that they were mailing these in from Israel and South Africa and Norway and all places around Sweden, whatever. So he'd get excited to get these international letters. And then they ended up having these remarkably similar fake money in, in them. And it, it, it apparently caused him a lot of soul searching to figure out who was behind these uh, pranks as they came in over several months. And for some reason, he'd stop by my office and share his thoughts about it. And I don't think I ever corrected him um, or even learned what he was doing to get even with uh, the supposed cult, uh, culprit, <laughs> John, who was, he, he had various roles at U of I, but I guess he was the kind of guy that would pull a prank. Thank you, Archie, and uh, I hope that uh, you are continuing to uh, collect uh, money and uh, turn it in. Uh, yeah, I've got one of the piggy banks, so I don't know how many of those are in circulation, but are there more available? Those are really nice. You put them on your counter by your bed and you pick up. People are doing lots and lots of walking these days, uh, isolating and getting exercise, and and I, I find um, quite a few coins and a couple of dollar bills I turned in today. So uh, thanks, so Archie. Can Mary Kay, are there uh, piggy banks available anywhere on, on campus? I know that we do have a few piggy banks. I'm looking at Sandy to see if she knows. Sandy, do you know specifically if we can get more? We do have a couple more and um, we can get those through the foundation office. Um, so. If anyone wants to send me a chat or a message, um, we can figure out how to get one of those to you. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat. Before we turn to the uh, memories of uh, Terry or favorite anecdotes from our panel, I did want to note for uh, those of you that uh, um, don't know the family that uh, Terry died uh, January 23rd, uh, 2014, uh, a little more than seven years ago at the age of 84. And uh, his uh, widow, Pat, uh, died just last month uh, at the age of uh, 85. Uh, and uh, we miss them both uh, terribly, uh, but I can't think of a better legacy of uh, their time in Moscow and Terry's uh, contributions to the university uh, to have this uh, uh, found money fund now with half a million dollars uh, 40 years uh, after it was, was founded. Um, so uh, Bruce, uh, uh, favorite memory of Terry, story that uh, hasn't yet been shared. I'll, I'll focus mostly on the found money fund since that's the, the uh, that, that's where we are today. I, I, I can remember one time traveling with Terry and 
he, uh, we were in, in Washington, D.C. and coming out of National Airport and happened to be with uh, Senator McClure. And um, Terry had this infectious way of uh, gathering other people into the Found Money Fund uh, fold. And, and so um, he very quickly had Senator McClure joining him, going through all of the coin returns in, in the, the uh, terminal. Uh, looking for for fun in coin returns in the in the telephone booths when we still had those and and lifting up cushions and um, it looked like Senator McClure was having a ball <laughs> and uh, I I just uh, am glad that there were no uh, cameras and no no cell phones available at that point in time because it would have looked really really weird but uh, um, one one. Uh, one story that we'll, we'll have to share, and that is that uh, Carol always was also the ethics officer uh, for the found money fund, meaning that there was um, there were found money fund fines that were very pure. You pick the, the coin up and you turn it in. On the other hand, again, he fenced commodities. He, people would bring things in and then he would try to resell them and then the money would go into the found money fund. And so there were times when, again, some of the, the contributions were quite questionable. And I remember one time that Terry probably did go well beyond any ethical boundaries, but it, it happened so quickly that Carol couldn't intervene. And as of one time that Farmhouse got into trouble, they had done some pranking that had, had not gone well. And so he called the leaders of farmhouse into his office and was pretending like he was the assistant principal of the high school and kind of wagging his finger at them and talking about, you know, how, how, how they might be able to make amends for, for what happened. And, and he just looked them in the eye and he goes, well, you know, guys, what do you think will make this right? Which meant he was looking for a bribe. <laughs> he, he, he was looking for what, whatever they thought would be a worthy, worthy uh, contribution to the fund, and uh, he would let them off the hook. So, uh, again, there are lots and lots and lots of stories, but, um, you know, some just took us out on the edge of, or sometimes beyond the ethical edge of the found money fund. So, uh, Carol, uh, uh, Bruce describes you as uh, the, the ethics chair. Uh, can you uh, recall uh, any contributions that were turned away because they didn't meet the, the high ethical standards of the fund? Uh, well, let me tell you, that goes right, leads right into one of my favorite memories of Terry is, to answer your question, <laughs> did he ever turn anything away? No. <laughs> most often not legitimate money, um, in my opinion, as the ethics chairman. But we had a, a little gig go, you know, he would, we, when it was just the two of us, he'd go, Ganso, can you believe this? What a scam. You know, I mean, it's like, he, he couldn't believe what, what it had become. But one thing we got to share, Kenton, was um, we had an annual meeting of the co-founders, co-directors every summer. And that's the point when I took formal minutes and everything, and we'd discuss all the issues that would come up. And that is where um, he would explain to me, he would confess all the types of things that Bruce has just described, that kind of thing. And I lived up here in Coeur d'Alene at that point. So I, I, I don't know that this is going on. And he would start his sentences with, Yanso, you're not gonna like this. <laughs> I knew then that it was something, or he would say, I, I hesitate to tell you this, but you know, in the interest of full disclosure, and then there would be this just ridiculous, awful thing that didn't meet any of our guidelines, or this was the favorite, Terry Armstrong, the victim, he'd say, Hey kid, what was I supposed to do? They wanted to give us our money, give us their money. So, you know, he negated any. I was only in title, the ethics chairman. It, it I had no influence over him. 
<laughs> I, I will add that Terry really uh, was attracted to uh, people who had had heart bypass surgeries. They, they had been required to go for long walks every day. And, and so, you know, he, he, he really liked the, the cardiac kids out there because they were always having to put their mileage in and, and it gave them something to do while they were getting back, working themselves back into health. We had a question from someone in the audience wondering why do we need to wait so long to put these funds to use uh, and uh, 68 years from now, uh, higher education might look very different. So um, Bruce or Carol or Mary Kay, uh, what was the rationale for just uh, holding the principal intact and uh, not spending any of the money in the intervening years? I'd speak a little bit to that. That's um, I remember him setting that up that way, and and really we got that question over and over and over. And there's been a there was a lot of pressure before Terry's passing, and you know it'll continue to be that way. Why can't we spend it now? But his whole premise from the get go, that first forty four dollars, and he never wavered from this, is no because he saw about um, compound interest. I think the concept of compound interest just, just uh, fascinated him. So there was no discussion about, he wanted a really big bang. And I think it, as everybody knows, this just grows and grows since we reinvest the earnings. And I don't know that that's a very good explanation, but that's the that was his preference and he was the boss. and. And that's the way we set it up, you know, at the his last couple of weeks, we finally got that endowment agreement set up and that's that's how it is. And I think it'll just be wonderful. I mean, we're gonna have millions of dollars in that uh, fund and millions to distribute. So the, the idea was that we would have more in the end to distribute going forward if we waited till the bicentennial. That's a long explanation. Archie's wondering, uh, does someone still go through the coins to look for rare, unusual collectible coins uh, that uh, might be worth more than their face value? Uh, and uh, I don't know if uh, <laughs> Carol has. Those, those are the rare coins. Oh, this is just one tin of rare coins. I have coins. Maybe Archie wants to help me with this since he knows stuff like this. I have. I have bags of coins from 52 different countries. And I've got, I've got this much like paper money. I mean, there's, there's like a zillion pieces of foreign paper currency. So um, I don't know if those dear people in the foundation are going through scanning for things like this, or I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Bless you if you are. And if there's anybody out there that wants to help me with this, I would appreciate it. Responding to the earlier question, Joy comments, uh, when the first dollars were put in the fund, um, it would ha have needed to take until the, uh, the bicentennial for the balance to be substantial. So uh, Terry was committed from the beginning that this was not going to be uh, spent uh, for immediate needs, but uh, for the, the long-term value of uh, the, the principal and the ability to at that uh, magic point uh, in 2089 to be able to start uh, spending only uh, the investment earnings at, at that point. Can, can, can I just add that, um, you know, Terry, this was just uh, grew to be just so much fun and it's interesting. It'd be fun to know how many people on this call um, have found money and sent money in because then, <laughs> then you happen to be donors and philanthropists to the University of Idaho. And I know many of you are as well. So he just, um, maybe maybe he put 2089, I know that would make it substantial, but it's also um, a way to get more and more people engaged with the university, knowing that philanthropy is fun and that philanthropy um, has such an impact. That's the one thing that I look at when I see the Found Money Fund is the power of every single gift, every single coin that we get that adds up to be something significant to help students get their education. And I think that Terry knew that and he 
liked to have fun with it and he knew that's a way to engage everybody and and that's part of what vandal giving day is all about so um his uh, magical thinking is working on and on that's his legacy to us it's a great transition for me to bring up one more uh, historic photo uh, of how philanthropy can be fun. And uh, this is uh, the Order of the Bobtail uh, for distinguished, devoted, selfless, continued contributions to the Found Money Fund of Idaho. So can anybody tell me who Bobby T. Bobtail is uh, and uh, why uh, he was chosen as the namesake for this special recognition to contributors to the Found Money Fund. Well, Kenton, I do happen to know about Bobby T. Bobtail, Captain Robert D. Bobtail. So the truth of the matter is that he was a figment of Terry's very active imagination. But <laughs> He was put out there, he created this person um, who was, by Terry's words, a, um, let's see, he had keen observational skills, he was a loyal philanthropist, and he had a very um, impressive career in his service with the Marines in World War I. I have a list of all the battles that he was involved with. I mean, where did he get this stuff? But Bobby T. Bobtail was fun because if there's one thing Terry did, it was always acknowledge the finders, acknowledge every gift. If it was a penny or a nickel or $20, always acknowledgement. And there got to be um, early on finders who would give us, we once they got to the point of $20, then they were given a bobtail certificate suitable for framing. And I believe that our own Bruce Pittman was one of the very early bobtail winners. It was it was kind of a cool thing, I thought. I don't know, Bruce should speak. He's, he's the one recipient on the call here who does have a bobtail award. It's, it's a humbling honor. And um, <laughs> I, I can only say in the uh, presentation scare, ceremony that I was a part of, um, Dr. Gibb and, and uh, Terry Armstrong were both heavily pranking me and scared scared the poop out of me. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, I, I treasure this award and hold it close. It's, it's among some of the, the most uh, important that I've, I've kept. Are there still certificates available for uh, the major contributors? And could we revive this now that we're at the 40th anniversary point and recognize donors of uh, a certain size or a certain notoriety of their, their findings? So Bruce, what do you think? We could revitalize it, but we might have to up that limit from 20 to, what do you say? Oh, yeah. 100? <laughs> I don't know. Anything's possible. If there's a demand, if there's money coming in and we see it. Well, I'd sure like to see one of those certificates go to Karen Sabota for uh, that $2,100 uh, back <laughs> in 1982. If uh, she wasn't recognized properly then, she should be now. And with our gratitude for joining us today to help to tell that story. So uh, we'll, we'll make a note of that. Uh, so uh, before we were, we're headed towards our five o'clock wrap up and before we finish, I, I would like to share with you a, a quote uh, from Terry Armstrong himself uh, that is contained in uh, his own self-written history of the Found uh, Money Fund and why he thought it was so important uh, that the tradition has been remarkable and the fund exemplifies the manifest loyalty of thousands of individuals to the University of Idaho. And uh, it's uh, one reason why I think we're all so proud to be alums or friends or faculty or staff or retirees of the University of Idaho. So uh, this has been a, a terrific panel. Gosh, thank you, Carol, Bruce, and, and Mary Kay. Thank you, Karen, for uh, joining us on short notice. And uh, before we go, uh, I need to acknowledge the sponsor 
for this uh, monthly series of the Cup of Joe. And uh, just need to get my um, credit line here. Uh, we are grateful to Payne West Insurance. Uh, Payne West is the leading broker in the Pacific Northwest where vandals can shop for home insurance, auto insurance, and more. Every new policy purchased uh, through Payne West supports the University of Idaho Alumni Association. Our next Cup of Joe program uh, will be Tuesday, May 11th, uh, a little more than a month from now. And the speaker will be Spencer Martin, the director of the Vandal Marching Band known as the Sound of Idaho. Uh, so I, I hope that you'll uh, join us then. Uh, thanks uh, again to this uh, uh, great audience. We have great participation, questions and comments in the chat. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future, uh, either virtual or actual uh, uh, alumni event. And uh, before we go, this is something I do with my classes. I'd uh, like to invite everyone in the audience who is uh, uh, either has a still photo or just their name up, if you would turn on your cameras and uh, give our panel a round of uh, applause virtually, or if uh, just give a, a wave in, in Zoom uh, for your participation. It's been really wonderful seeing so many familiar faces today. Uh, thanks for being part of Cup of Joe. Don't forget Vandal Giving Day, April 6th and 7th of this week. And uh, hope to see you on campus again soon. Go Vandals. <laughs>